1920, Americans were tired of war abroad and progressive programs at home. The high-minded rhetoric of Woodrow Wilson had lost its appeal. The country was in a conservative mood. Number 29, Warren G. Harding, Republican, 1921 to 1923, 55 years old, from Ohio. Warren Harding is the only president to be elected on his birthday. In his successful campaign, he touted a return to normalcy. We're not going to do anything big and ambitious. We're going to create a period in which things are quiet and calm. A former newspaper man, Harding was the seventh president born in the state of Ohio. No one ever accused him of being a cold fish. He was an extrovert, a gambler, a drinker, and allegedly a womanizer. He also played the sousaphone. He liked to be around people, liked to glad hand, liked to slap people in the back. That's actually a, a, a rather valuable political skill. Harding has been portrayed as someone who wasn't fit to be president, that he lacked intellect and ambition. People will say that he didn't want to be president or that he didn't have the self-confidence to do it. Uh, he did want to be president. He was a savvy man in his politics, and he did have a very strong sense for what he wanted to accomplish. Harding wasn't the type of president who thought he had all the answers. Mr. Harding uh, said that he was inviting the best minds into the cabinet. In a very real sense, this was the case. His Secretary of State was Charles Evans Hughes, who was a distinguished man. His Secretary of Commerce was Herbert Hoover. This was a good cabinet. Harding's most important achievement was the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921. Passed at Harding's urging, it gave the executive branch greater control over federal spending and for the first time in history, required the president to submit an annual budget to Congress. Harding scored the other great success of his presidency when he convened an international conference in Washington that resulted in an historic arms reduction agreement between the naval powers of the world. The Washington Naval Conference was the only serious arms limitation arrangement that was made in the 20s and 30s. That was Mr. Harding. In the summer of 1923, Harding took a train trip west, becoming the first sitting president to visit Alaska. But his health was failing. On July 29th, he arrived at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco and checked into the presidential suite to recuperate. Four days later, with his wife Florence at his bedside, the president suffered a heart attack. Florence pleaded with the doctors to save him, but it was too late. Harding was dead. Those people who have any image of Harding at all remember him as a kind of joke, and certainly as a failure. It would be hard for such people to understand the enormity of the response to Harding's death. It would be a short-lived period of grief and reverence. Less than a year after his death, several scandals came to light that forever shattered Harding's image. The most significant scandal involved Harding's Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall. He was accused of improperly leasing Navy oil reserves at Elk Hills, California and Teapot Dome in Wyoming to a pair of wealthy oil men in exchange for an illegal kickback. Teapot Dome, as the affair came to be known, was the most infamous presidential scandal prior to Watergate. I don't know of any evidence that Harding actually was complicit in these scandals or that he personally benefited from them but he certainly was guilty of appointing mediocre, not very honest people to very significant positions. Harding's reputation was further tarnished by the publishing of two scandalous books. One insinuated that the president's wife, Florence, had poisoned him. Another was written by Nan Britton, a woman who claimed to have had an affair with Harding and given birth to his daughter. These sensational tales were dubious at best, but widely believed at the time. Today, Harding is remembered more for the scandals that swirled around him, both real and imagined, than anything else. One historian who has re-examined Harding's record thinks history has been particularly unfair to our 29th president. He was a good president, even verging on an excellent president. His great tragedy was that physically he was unable to live out his term. 
he was good with the Senate. Uh, he was good on foreign affairs. He was good with the budget. And I asked, what more do you wish?